tonight we are exploring a metaphobia, which is the fear of vomit and a lot of the food avoidance uh, and situation avoidance compulsions that can go along with that. We are going to uh, explore what was involved with uh, cutting out the food avoidance compulsions I had and uh, yeah, tackling those fears around vomit and all of the nausea and stuff like that. Um, and yeah, this really builds in for people who caught the interview today with Corinne Chen, we were talking a lot about food and exercise. Uh, and one of the things Corinne brought up was about the beliefs uh, and those kinds of equations that we have in our heads that are really not helpful for us. And the beliefs and equations I had in my head around the foods that I'd labeled as bad, around the foods that I saw as like, I must avoid them. It was much, much later in my recovery journey, my journey with mental health, that I realized those were part of the compulsions. And that maybe I actually could eat those foods. Maybe I could interact with those experiences differently. But when I worked on this stuff that we're going to cover tonight, it was long after I had already tackled, you know, I was done therapy. I wasn't doing any compulsions that, you know, would have classified as a disorder. But it was recognizing that the same patterns that went into the kind of more severe, more clinical mental illness symptoms were at work in all of these foods I was avoiding and these physical experiences that I believed would happen. So I wanted to start us off with this question. What if your personality quirks, your likes and dislikes, your pet peeves are just coping mechanisms to avoid or control pain and uncertainty uh, and you can actually change them if you'd like to do that? We don't have to. Uh, and in many ways, you know, recognizing that they're in place to control pain and uncertainty uh, doesn't mean we have to change them. They might, we might have brought them into our lives uh, to handle very traumatic experiences. But if we are no longer in the situations where we needed those control behaviors to handle that trauma and to handle that uncertainty, then it can be useful to recognize that all of that controlling and avoiding no longer serves us. But often it's become, because it started quite young, we'll often see it as totally baked into our identities. I know for me it was that way. I, I did, you know, these were just things I didn't like. And I was fine with identifying as a person who, oh, I just, I just don't eat that. That's not something I like. I don't do that. That, that was me. Uh... And so it was, it was a really interesting experience to be open to the possibility that this way of seeing myself uh, and physically feeling that this was a necessary part of my identity um, was something I could change, was not actually, it didn't have to be part of me. Mm -hmm. the, uh, and so that's, uh, yeah, that's what we were going to explore tonight, but I think you know, getting into that stuff, like why you would start to look at something like that. Or we'd say, oh, okay, this thing that I thought is totally part of my identity, maybe, maybe it's not. I think to explore that and maybe to be open to that, I, th I figured it'd be great for everybody in the chat. For one, welcome. Welcome to the Vomit Show. I thought it would be good for us to explore why we work on our mental health. Because it was, it was really understanding that which helped me start uh, to look at this. Mm, start, Jesse, you're saying there, I thought about this today. Every preference, every thought, if it's intrusive or we think it is a thought, you always say it's all brain stuff. But then our values are brain stuff too. So how do you differentiate that? Oh, yeah, it's totally stuff we could come up with. Yeah, values are just directions. They're also not attached to us. Uh, values, I, was just, I just posted a video over on Instagram talking about this. Uh, yeah, our values are directions. They're, you know, we're wandering this wilderness of life 
and our values, our directions will take in the wilderness. And on the way there, we'll need to put into practice many different skills and we'll use many different tools to go in the direction we want to go. And sometimes going in the direction we want to go that we value will also mean going in different directions. Uh, maybe we come to a lake. And so there, doing what we value means canoeing really, really, really hard. But when we get to the other side of the lake, there's a cliff. And so we don't want to say, well, my value is canoeing. My identity is canoeing. Uh, and then try to use the canoe to go up the cliff because, of course, that, that will probably not work very well. Um, actually, when we get to the cliff, then it's about recognizing that moving in the direction we value is about using mountain climbing skills. Maybe it's about learning mountain climbing skills. It doesn't mean we did something wrong when we were crossing the lake with the canoe. Those are the skills we needed in that situation. Now we need a different set of skills. But likewise, we may get to the cliff and realize, oh, actually, I'm going to have to spend a lot of time learning how to climb this cliff. Uh, I, actually, there's an easier path. Uh, it'll take a bit longer to get to where I want to go. But it, and it might go in a different direction for now. Uh, but it'll actually be something I, I might enjoy more. Uh, and so we adjust and move with it, rather than getting attached to the idea, I must climb this cliff. Uh, and so, yeah, values are directions. They're also, yeah, not our identity. And we can be very light with them. So now, everybody, let's throw the question out here. Uh, why do we work on our mental health? So throw some, throw some ideas down the chat below. Why do we work on our mental health? Yeah, like, what, what's in it for you? You're all, you know, presumably whether you're watching this on Twitch or later on YouTube, you're here because you're working on your mental health. Why? Okay, D-Dad, you said, I work on my mental health so I can make big yummy dinners. Make great big dinners. Star Jesse said, not be a slave to the brain stuff. Ashik, he said, to enjoy. So we can enjoy what life has to offer. No, Yuki. So we can do what we want to do. Shorty Pants, Shorty Pants Susie, welcome to live... I'll capitalize it, to live meaningful lives with or without anxiety. Yeah, it can come along or not come along. Depends. Yeah, start Jesse, so you can do the things you want to do. Mm-hmm. Wanderson. Oh, you said you work on your mental health because... I have a lot of life goals that require me to stop listening to my brain. Why do we listen to the brain? Yeah, brains, not useful. We spend so much time listening to them. Oh, pupper, pupper potato there. I like that you, uh, you worked life and death into this one. Uh, so he said, so we build the things we want to build in our short lifespans. Indeed. Yeah, and start just you saying that on there below again. Yeah, like I just, my wish is just to do what I want to do. This, what, what you touched on um, was a big, so many of you mentioned this, it was a big part of it for me too. Um, was just really, you know, even this, you know, make big, great dinners. Like we want to do a thing that we want to do so we can enjoy life. So we can do what we want to do. So I can do the things I want to do to live meaningful lives with or without anxiety. So we build the things we want to build in our short lifespans. So it, it really helped me to look a lot when I was working on mental health at uh, freedom, 
freedom and flexibility. Like saying, I want to be able to do the things I want to do. So if my brain is the only barrier to doing something, then it's, you know, it's a, a challenge that I'm going to look at and really consider why, why is that useful? Like why, why do I have to keep avoiding that thing if uh, it could be useful for me to do it when the only thing making me avoid it is just a bunch of stuff my brain is throwing up? And so that's part of what really got me looking at food. Because I would say this is all wrapped up in physical fitness too. It's appropriate we're in the, we got the gym background tonight because I, uh, I couldn't really exercise until after uh, I took care of my mental health. And that's not to say I didn't go to the gym. I, I, I went to, tr- I, I told myself I was going, I, I how to describe this. I did go to the gym frequently when I struggled with my mental health. But it, that was all full of compulsions. And so I, I wouldn't really exercise. Um, I wasn't really uh, pushing myself in a way that would help me reach my goals. I would avoid all sorts of exercises because I was afraid of harm uh, in all sorts of different ways. Um, and I also had a very bad relationship just with understanding what was going on in my body. So I would, you know, I would always quit exercises um, before... I, I was, you know, when really I could go much further, I'd be like, ooh, this is too much, I better stop. So it was only after cutting out a lot of compulsions, really recovering from all the different mental illness diagnoses, that I was able to start exercising in a healthy way. And so I was starting to do all sorts of weightlifting exercises that I'd avoided in the past. So like lots of Olympic weightlifting, because I just had this idea I was gonna get injured. As I was doing that, uh, I recognized that my nutrition wasn't really where uh, it could be to help fuel doing all of the exercises I wanted to do. I learned that I was not eating nearly enough because, uh, you know, I just years of food compulsions. And then I looked at the foods that I was afraid of, the foods that I'd cut out of my life that I saw as foods I didn't eat. And they were all foods that would be kind of useful uh, to things like weightlifting and, and you know, a, a kind of intense fitness practice. So it's part of this freedom thing, this like wanting to do the things I wanted to do. If, if these foods are going to be useful to me, you know, building skills and capacity, why can't I eat them? And the only thing getting in the way of that was my brain and then all of the physical feelings that would come up when I was around those foods. So let's take a, let's take a look at those foods. Uh, I think to understand this, we got to say for anybody that's unfamiliar with emetophobia. Um, yeah, so like, you know, straightforward definition is just the fear of vomit, right? Like emetophobia to emit. So the fear of emitting stuff that you emit, uh, the fear of puking. So it's both the fear of vomit and the fear of puking. But as we talk about all the time, the brain doesn't stop at just a topic. It's much more about patterns and the brain is very logical. So me being afraid of vomit, and I was you know, very afraid of vomit, just hearing somebody vomit, seeing any vomit would then make me vomit. Um, and so I, of course, wanted to avoid that. So then I would avoid anything about vomit. But the brain, being as creative as it is, went looking for anything else that was kind of similar to vomit or probably, you know, I'm probably, I was probably too young to really remember it, but probably things also that I'd had some kind of bad experience around and my brain decided, oh, that thing will make us vomit. And so I had to avoid it. Uh, like I, I, even later when I was in my teens, I got food poisoning once and yeah, the food that gave me food poisoning, uh, I could, I, I could not eat it again for, I guess it would have been decades. Uh, so for me, the biggest food, eggs was the number one, uh, most, yes, yeah, I see people saying, mm, eggs in the chat. No, eggs, eggs were the number one bit, just the smell of eggs. Anybody like people, uh, 
uh, I wouldn't let my family cook eggs in our house because just the smell of eggs would make me start to like heave and get nauseous. Uh, and so, but yeah, you can also see like these, these eggs do kind of look like uh, somebody vomited on a piece of toast. And then of course, uh, oatmeal was up there too. And so these were, I would say also the two big foods that I recognized it would be really useful if I could eat them. But again, oatmeal, the texture, the look of it, couldn't, couldn't look at it, could, definitely couldn't put it in my mouth. Uh, but similarly, especially when I was a kid, um, this one were common. I, I, anything soggy was a huge, because just if it started to have that mushy texture, it will, I see somebody in the chat there mentioned chunky smoothies. And so that's where this one comes in. Um, I don't know if anybody knows what this is right here. This is only something I experienced in Japan, but uh, this is amazaki. And so it's... Um, it's basically, you could think of it as sake, right? So like alcohol made from rice, but it's still got rice in it. And so it's sweeter. It's not as high in alcohol, I don't believe. Um, so it's almost like alcoholic rice porridge. Oh, but you could, the reason I even picked this picture, you can see it there. See that lump on that spoon right there? Oh, I can re remember uh, because it was uh, this, uh, you know, common thing that you, New Year's comes around Japan, you go to a temple, there's going to be somebody serving amazaki there, or you're at somebody's house and they're serving it. Really, really common at New Year's. So many New Year's Eve experiences where I'm like trying to be nice, sipping amazaki, and just trying not to vomit if I get a, like a lump or something in there. Uh, and so, of course, kanji was uh, not, not allowed, not possible. But interesting, see the, the egg here, like a kind of raw egg. Raw egg was okay because this wasn't about egg. This was about the smell and the texture of cooked egg. So it was funny. And this is always, you know, there's always these weird ways that the brain works. I could eat raw eggs with no problem. But if, oh, it put any heat to it and, oh, the, my whole body would uh, be not, would just be so unhappy. Uh, and of course, uh, cottage cheese, also, uh, also something now that, um, you know, especially not so much now, but the years when I was really uh, getting into fitness, uh, yeah, would eat buckets of it for 30 years of my life, could not look at it. And uh, yeah, so oatmeal, and I think that's key too. Yeah, the, the eggs, the oatmeal, the cottage cheese did not touch them for 30 years. This was all stuff I worked on um, when I was 30. And now, especially for anybody um, that didn't like looking at any of that stuff, here is a palate cleanser just to really cute puppies. Look at, look at how happy they are. Let us forget everything we just looked at. And then we will get into the exercises involved with recognizing the challenge here and then cutting out the compulsions. But let's take a look at anything that's going on over on the chat. The Angry Bear. Yeah, he said diet is so important for mental health, especially gut, uh, gut biome stuff. Uh, so I found it was in reverse. I, so I had all sorts of, so not only was there lots of food I wouldn't eat because I would get nauseous and all sorts of stuff like that. I had lots of digestion issues that I did not even realize until after recovering because they had just always been part of my life. Like now everything down there works so well and that was not the case. Like I thought having all sorts of digestion, gut problems was, was normal. Uh, and now I know, like now the way things are is, is a way better uh, normal. And so I found it was really the opposite actually, learning how to take care of my brain uh, learning how to do healthy things, learning how to interact with experiences in healthier ways uh, was so beneficial to my gut. Uh, because, yeah, you can see, like, we judge something as dangerous, as bad, and we get anxious, and we, we cultivate those butterflies in our stomach. I imagine that's not good for our guts to always be doing that. Um, and so now being able to interact with an experience and not get caught up in all of the compulsions and all then all of the feelings that would come from those compulsions. Uh, it seems to be really great uh, for my gut. 
Um, but also, of course, I can, I can eat a much uh, healthier, more balanced diet now because I'm not caught up in all of uh, the brain stuff. So I think, it's, I think it's, it's useful to look at nutrition stuff and, and we see all sorts of, there's always interesting research going on, uh, but I'd say it's, it's a two-way street. Yeah, probably eating healthy helps the brain, but the brain can also help the gut. Oh, probably, yeah, you're saying, I find taste aversions and texture aversions just hold me back from eating everything. Yep, that's what this is about. And because there could be all sorts of reasons too. It's, that's how even I struggle to figure out how exactly to title this tonight because yeah, I think a lot of this for me was the emetophobia, but I know many people, and this comes up all the time, you know, just generally in our community, working with clients, the works, many people just have all sorts of food avoidance compulsions and they'll develop them for their own set of reasons to control really their, their rituals to control something. Uh, so in my case, a lot of the food avoidance was about controlling that fear of vomit and the uncomfortable feelings. Uh, but for others, it might be uh, different. So uh, I've already talked a bit about this. And I, I, I brought the value squirrel in here uh, because value squirrel is weightlifting. It started off with considering why, like, why am I working on my mental health? Well, I, I want the freedom to do the things I want to do. So I, I want to be able to eat these foods. Uh, but then also, like I was saying there, looking at the fact that I wanted to make uh, physical fitness, something I practiced in my life as a way to support me, uh, that these foods, I was doing it, I was still doing it in line with something that I wanted to do and practice. So I wasn't just seeking out weird foods because, you know, like sea cucumber, I don't know if anybody's had raw sea cucumber, I don't like it. I'm fine with not, not learning how to like raw sea cucumber. However, looking at my values and what I wanted to be building and the capacities I wanted to build, it was really useful to look at some of these other foods and say, hey, my life would be a lot easier if I could add these in. So first went like, why are we doing this in the first place? What do we value? So that's always step one, right? Where are we going? We come back to this all the time. It doesn't matter what the compulsion is. First, even though there's some big fear, or there's some big problem we're caught up in, first look at where we want to go. So I wanted to fuel lifting heavy acorns. The second part is to look at what the real underlying fears are that are happening here. Because, yeah, it's, the thing is, it's not going to be just about vomit. And this is, I think, when sometimes when we look for an underlying fear or a core fear, whatever you're going to call it, we sometimes think there's maybe there's only one. But the reality is there's often going to be multiple underlying fears that are working. I don't know if they actually consciously are working together, but they are overlapping is maybe the better word. There are intersections between them that complicate the work. Uh, and so we want to tackle all of those underlying fears. Uh, because sometimes too, they're not, they're not like a fear that we can really articulate. It's not a thing I'm afraid of, uh, which is why I put the first one up there. Just, I don't want to feel bad. It, it's such a physical experience. Like thinking back to eggs, if somebody was cooking eggs and I smelled it, I would begin to dry heave. It was a really unpleasant physical experience. So even beyond saying, oh, well, is it about social anxiety or it's about, you know, not getting to live your life? Yeah, those are, those are fears too. Uh, but it was also, it was just, I did not want to feel bad. Right? And there were all sorts, right? When we look at patterns, I was doing so many compulsions in my life to avoid and control feeling bad. So of course it made sense. Hey, if these foods make me feel bad, of course I'm going to avoid them and cut them out. Uh, so there was that. So as part of this was also part of this bigger project around learning how to interact differently with uncomfortable physical experiences. As well, though, there was a social anxiety element to it. I didn't want to risk. There was a lot of foods, the kind of the foods I would avoid would increase 
if there were people around because then I would see it as oh well so I would add in then a whole other set of foods that I saw as riskier for being you know food poisoning or being poisoned or whatever going bad so then if there were other people around or there was a meeting happening or there was something some kind of social interaction the number of foods would increase uh, and then also just in generally as part of this was the fear yeah, it would interfere with life and that was both again because it was an uncomfortable physical experience so if i was feeling terrible then i couldn't do the things i wanted to do but also i i attached a lot of meaning to the bad foods so <laughs> If, you know, if I had to eat one of the foods or so, or the food was around or something, um, that, like, that would become a bad day. So also having this negative, I don't know, bad energy aura around these foods uh, and believing that, believing that the, these were bad, also then messing up just having a normal day. Uh, so also it was seeing, like, I was going to want to go after that. Uh, so the reason we do this uh, is so that we can lay out an action plan to attack those underlying fears as we cut out the compulsions and do things we value. Star Jesse saying, okay, I have a question. All mental health problems seem to have to do with fear of something. Is the answer every time to do the thing you're scared about? Many times, of course, only if it's part of what you want to do in life. And with that, show the brain it's okay, and then the brain reprograms itself. I, I, I find it's not as simple. And, you know, you were touching on this there, saying, well, it's, you know, doing the thing you're afraid of, you know, of course, as part of what you want to do in life. And I, I sometimes, but I, I emphasize more of a focus on the thing you want to do in life. Because quite often that thing that we're afraid of, the way to tackle it is to not do anything about it. That actually, uh, and this is really common, a very common compulsion is people going after things they're afraid of because they want to rewire the brain. And I say that's a compulsion because that's, that's all you think of any OCD uh, compulsion. Say somebody is doing a, washing, is a hand washing compulsion. It's because they're they want to get rid of the feeling that it's dirty and often that's what we do with fears we kind of see a fear as bad and dirty we're like oh, i'm gonna go do this thing and by doing this exposure i'm gonna scrub out the fear and i won't feel afraid anymore and i i would say that's just another compulsion uh, and that the focus that there's really nothing wrong with fear uh, and that I don't find it useful to make that the goal. I, I would focus on the things that we want to do more of in our lives. Pump potato. He said, uh, to clarify, my goal is to eat everything. Luckily, I don't have many taste aversions left at this point. Luckily. Oh, that's awesome. So he said, so I do a pretty good job of eating everything. Enjoy eating everything. He said, I do love to cook and try new foods. I've realized cherry tomatoes have been a good place to start. They're a bit more flavorful than the big watery tomatoes. Totally. <laughs> Wanderson, you asked how many times did Mark vomit when he started to eat eggs regularly? We, uh, we will get to what I did to eat eggs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Angry Bear, you brought up there something. Sometimes there's an inexplicable sense of doom and foreboding. Totally. And so often it's not, we can't articulate the fear. It's just, I, I don't like this doom, this feeling that everything is going to end, that terrible things are going to happen. Yeah. Often it's, we don't have to go any further than that. It's just seeing, oh yeah, I don't like that. Uh, and then that's the thing we work with. Yeah. Start just here saying, I love it. So straight up focus on doing the things you want to do in life. And when fears comes up, have the fear and do the things. Exactly. The, the fear can be there because yeah, so often we see it as dirty like bad, I must clean it. Um, but seeing, no, the fear can be there and I am going to celebrate this thing that I want to do. And so that was, that was really what it was about with the food. Saying, okay, this food right now, I am afraid of it and it causes all of this physical stuff I don't like, but I want to take the food and move it into the enjoyment column. 
uh, and make it part of my life. Uh, and so, yeah, I can be afraid of, and as you'll see here, I can be afraid of vomiting on people. I can be afraid of feeling terrible. Uh, I can be afraid of all of those things. They're all things that can happen. And so this is where the action plan comes in. So after identifying those underlying fears, uh, you'll see what I did there then. Make sure you can see all the text. What I did after under identifying those underlying fears is basically turn them into streams of exercises. So they help me see what the mental fitness plan is going to be about. Essentially, you know, saying, oh, okay, well, what's, what's the strength thing we're going to work on? What's the endurance thing? What's the flexibility thing we're going to work on? So because I didn't want to feel bad. So the way I tackled that was by eating the foods that would trigger the nausea so I could learn new ways of interacting with those physical experiences. So I wanted to seek out those physical experiences that I was so afraid of having. And I say, hey, okay, I can, I can have these experiences. I can be awesome at having these experiences. That's when we think about, I'll often describe it as being a feelings athlete. Right? So I wanted to get awesome at having those physical experiences. That's part of what uh, I, and I really learned that from what I was doing in the gym, right? Where in the past, there were all of these physical things that would happen when I was working out that I saw as bad as indicators that I'd gone too far. But in reality, they, they were just a totally normal, natural part of what I was doing. And so I was starting to take that same approach to these other physical feelings. Because again, I, if there was any wrong feeling in my body, I would just go into panic shutdown mode. I was like, oh no, this isn't right. Why is it here? How do we get rid of it? Now I want to have it. Okay, so the second stream of exercises then was around the social anxiety stuff, right? So people will see me as gross. Like I'm going to vomit uh, or have explosive diarrhea uh, while I'm in front of people. And right, so there were all of those additional foods that I wouldn't eat if I was doing something social. And also, if there was something important, like, uh, I can remember uh, as a, a kid in like high school um, and at university too, if I was giving a speech uh, or some kind of big presentation, I, I wouldn't eat before it at all because I, I would just be so convinced that if I ate anything, I, all sorts of bad things would happen and I wouldn't be able to do the speech, I wouldn't be able to do the presentation. Um, so I would, yeah, just not eat. So now the goal with this, with tackling those social anxiety fears was to eat the bad foods right before doing something that I would judge as important around people. And you can see, you know, on the slide here, they're in quotation marks because of course they are not bad foods, but also the things I was judging as important that was also entirely made up in my head. I was the one assigning that meaning to these things. Right? And then, like we often do, we judge something, we attach a meaning to it, and then we react to it. So I'm like, ooh, this is so important, you can't screw it up. And then my brain tries to help me by saying, okay, well, what are the ways you could screw this up? Oh, well, you could vomit on everybody. Okay, better not eat. And then the last one, right, this idea that it would interfere with life that I would, I would vomit on, you know, when I want to do something important or I would have bad foods on these days. Uh, and so it was really then about doing activities I cared about um, that I, you know, I would have viewed as ruined in the past by the bad food. So actually purposely having the bad foods on the days that I saw as like special or good. So I could start to say, hey, no, these, these foods I just, they are, they are nutrients that can fuel me doing awesome things. And that's what's going to happen. Uh, and so this is, but this is a format that you can really use to approach all sorts of different compulsions. All right, think about going back. We look at why are we doing what we're doing? What do I value? What's the underlying fears? Then you take them and they become the streams of actions that you're going to work on. Angry Bear said here, I guess part of the issue for me is that I have a fear that life will engulf me, like I won't be able to handle life. Yep. And that's, we want to control things, we want to be ourselves. 
Uh, and so it's looking at there, you know, I'd look at, okay, well, what's the, what's the fear? What's, what are you going to miss out on? What are you going to lose? Why is that bad? Uh, and then it's about uh, stepping into that. Uh, uh, something possibly to check out could be the Locus of Control video, which is on YouTube now. It was a stream we did here on Twitch, but it's all about shifting that power back to us where we're afraid, oh no, I'm going to step into life and I won't be in control. And it's about starting to see that you know, we can identify something we value and we can move towards it. And yeah, we might be afraid in the wilderness. The wilderness is going to take over and consume us. Uh, but we can want to go and explore. We can want to be curious about that wilderness. Uh, and we can empower ourselves to navigate it. Mm -hmm. And really take back that power. Uh, so often the brain is going to do that. Right? Where it, You see it there. It kicks away uh, your power uh, to do the things you want to do. And we just Notice that and we bring it back to ourselves. Star Jesse said here, but wait, you know how you said that stress and fear is bad for your gut. Are you saying that when you do the thing you want to do, you just have to take the stress and fear for some time and then you get more emotionally fit and then you recover and then like you said, you had less stress and your gut was better. Uh, yes and, but the process of sitting with the uncomfortable feelings and the fear was in many ways physically what it actually felt like was showing the body that it could calm down so it it wasn't it actually isn't a super at first it feels like i'm about to do something really terrible but then uh, it actually becomes uh, much more enjoyable and that's because the the compulsions we do are actually the compulsions create so much more stress than cutting out the compulsions because they're like this just this ongoing self-destructive carnival so this is a good segue then into yeah what was actually involved what was actually involved with cutting out these compulsions? So tackling the physical sensations was really what these two were about. Um, and so like Wanderson asked earlier about the vomiting with the eggs. And so like, we'll, let's get into that. And I love the concept of what I always call festivals of curiosity. And often I'll suggest to people that they do them for a week which is where you pick some kind of change that you want to explore in your life and you practice it each day for a week in some form. It could change each day. When it came to eggs, because it was so big, I did not believe that just spending a week on it was going to give me the, the room to change how I was interacting with those physical experiences and the food and such so much history and all of the unhelpful beliefs I had around it so I decided and this was a great thing to do too simply because it's so you know we we often put a lot of pressure and urgency on ourselves to change and now I had already and I already caught out all of the, the kind of obvious OCD compulsions at this point uh, I would yeah I was well and recovered so when I looked at this, I knew it was going to be useful to give it a, you know, give it a month because there was this kind of, you know, the brain loves urgency and we got to solve it, fix it now. Uh, but I knew if I gave myself a month and said, hey, you know what? I don't have to do anything. I don't have to work on anything else this month, but becoming friends with nausea. That's, that's really useful to just give yourself that space. I don't have to fix it today. I don't even have to fix it this week. We're just going to spend a month becoming friends with really uncomfortable feelings. And to start to what you were asking about there, yeah, it, that very quickly becomes, I mean, not actually that stressful of an experience. Because, yeah, it's initially noticing those physical feelings coming up but then really changing 
how I was interacting with them. And yeah, we're getting, this is actually on the next slide. Uh, you know, in, yeah, it's weird because it's making friends with an experience I'd hated for 30 years. But in that moment, it really was about saying, okay, body, like you want to vomit. So rather than just immediately reacting to that, and this is a skill we use with panic attacks too, right? Rather than immediately going, oh no, this is bad, got to control it, which only creates more panic attack, right? It makes it worse. The same with the nausea. The moment I go, oh, this is bad, I got to control it, uh, then things get worse. So actually, it was actually way more of a, a pleasant experience uh, to ride the feeling to want to have that feeling to let it go throughout my body and a lot of it was that because in the past it would be very I would really try to I don't know be very forceful and hard on it uh, and this was about yeah let it find like let's let's have my entire body be nauseous let's because we want to vomit like that was, that was part of it too, right? Like wanting it. I want this to happen. Let's make it happen. I want, I want to feel this everywhere. I want my fingertips to feel like they're going to vomit on people. Uh, and very quickly, uh, the, the body is like, oh, it's just kind of, you know, the, the wave crests and it, um, it subsides. Uh, but even if it doesn't, because yeah, at first... No, like the first couple times of doing this, it's a pretty intense experience. And then it's just making space for that. It's inviting that horrible, physically uncomfortable feeling to sit down beside me and admire, you know, the great cheesy crust I put on my omelet. And taking my brain to something I'm going to enjoy and, and showing myself that I can have an uncomfortable physical feeling and I can enjoy something. I can feel physically wrong. I can feel bad and I can do something I value. Pupper potato said here. So I have a question related to this. I'm not sure if this is the same thing, but oftentimes when I feel the need to vomit, I actually do. Should I just lean into it in that way? So this... Uh, so th this comes up a lot too with vomiting. And so I find it useful to, well, there's, there's two things. Cause yeah, I would, uh, have a lot of experiences of vomiting too. Uh, like, especially, especially if somebody, if somebody else vomited, oh, I was, I was definitely going to vomit. Uh, and yeah, with all of this food stuff, I, yeah, they initially, I would be wanting to vomit. And so the thing that I explored was how that me vomiting was trying to like fix a feeling and to explore how to not do it. Uh, Cause yeah, a lot of people too will, you know, feel like they need to vomit. And so then go and try to make themselves vomit to get like, Oh, like I've, okay, well now I've vomited. So now we can move on. So there I find it, it's useful to not, to actually, like a lot of this riding the nausea wave was like learning how to feel that I was going to vomit and not do it. Uh, so yeah, I would say like as a thing to explore, uh, being at next time the urge uh, is coming, it is that moment to be like, okay, well is this, like do I need to, like have I contracted some i don't know like virus or flu or whatever that you know is going to make me do this or do i know that this is actually just part of like the things that my brain likes to do um, and if it is then it really helped me to explore how do i how do i just let this experience happen and i don't have to do anything yes as you mentioned there yeah you said so yeah because i feel like sometimes i'm like oh well it's inevitable now so i'll just go to the toilet yeah uh, and yeah, going to the toilet because I was like worried that I was going to vomit um, and the try. So I found it really helpful to cut that out. Uh, and that like that was part of to the um, the doing these exercises around people. Make it like saying, OK, I'm here, but I am brain. I'm not I'm not moving. Yeah, if, we, if this is going to happen, well, it's going to happen. But 
uh, I'm probably not going to do it either. But I'm just, I'm staying here with people. The, um, I, I think, it, but it is, again, so useful to recognize how physical this stuff is. There was, so a member on the Discord server shared a story earlier today that I thought was a great example of just how physical this stuff is. So um, I, I captured it here. I wanted to read it out. So they said, I actually went through a period early in college where I involuntarily vomited due to anxiety. At the time, this happened about one to three times a week. Even now that I'm over it, I still am pretty sensitized to nausea. Before my exam, my body decided it was nauseous, and I spent a decent amount of time dry heaving the morning before the exam. However, I picked myself up and took the exam and passed. I guess I just wanted to share because it was a good example of how I, I didn't let that get in the way of me performing on the exam, and that even worst case scenarios like vomiting can be dealt with. Totally. Like, and so there's, there's so many great things that I like. So that's an example, too, of what I was talking about with uh, uh, like the important days or the days would be ruined and things like that. And showing, no, like, okay, so fine. If I'm going to have this, this vomiting, nauseous experience, I, I can do that. And I can also go and do an exam. The, uh, but also recognizing how physical this is. Because I think when you hear phobias, sometimes I think we have a tendency to see it as uh, a mental, I don't know, a mental challenge, a mental problem. But it, at least with this stuff around nausea, and it seems really consistent for everybody who runs into these struggles, it's very physical. It goes beyond something you're just talking about with voices in your head, yeah, you're, you're drive heaving. And so it's learning how to have that feeling and not do the, what we could see as like a physical compulsion. And it's challenging at first, totally. It's a weird, weird uh, experience. But that's why I say it's, it's really about building this totally different relationship with your body and with physical sensations in your body. And yeah, you it, that you may have had that relationship with your body and with nausea for 20, 30 years. Um, and it's changeable. Yeah, if it's useful to you to change that, that's a doable thing. The, uh, and so, and I think, yeah, to say in terms of, so what happened? Any of those foods that I mentioned before, it, it wouldn't even occur to me that there was a problem with them. Actually, I love overnight oats. Uh, I eat tons of oatmeal. The eggs, after a month of eating eggs, and also making it about how can I enjoy this? So there was an element of uh, making it fun, uh, finding things to be curious about, uh, trying, actually purposely trying different types of recipes, also as a way to give my brain somewhere to go so if we're trying to get good at a skill, uh, the brain doesn't just have to sit there uh, hating and judging on something and checking the body and seeing what's happening and all of that. Uh, so it really helped to approach it, again, like a festival. And that's so if you're working on any of this stuff, uh, always, always, something I always ask uh, clients before we get into planning a festival of curiosity around something uh, is to think about an experience in your life that you really enjoyed uh, some kind of festival a concert a place you visited um, a party some kind of event that you remember really enjoying really feeling engaged with and to look at why you felt engaged with that and then See the elements you can take from that experience and apply it to supporting yourself through this difficult change you're going to make so that you can make it engaging, so that you can make it easier for yourself. Because I think, yeah, we self-sabotage a lot, right? We make it, you know, we make a difficult change even more difficult and unappealing and we make it complex. And then, of course, we're like, oh, that, that was stupid. It didn't work oh, well, I guess I'm stuck with it. Uh, so part of this was, you know, because I was, I was going to eat something every day that I had avoided my entire life and it made me uh, vomit. 
Um, so how do you make that? How do you make that easy and fun um, and enjoyable? It's uh, so yeah, whatever you take on, it's something uh, to consider. And then after I did eggs, I did oatmeal. But I'd say the oatmeal after I had done eggs, I'd kind of cracked it. Uh, pun intended. And then uh, yeah, everything else was um, like I, I understood how to do it. Right? I understood. Okay, there's gonna be a feeling, and that's neat. I can have that feeling. And here's the thing: I value doing. How do I engage with it? How do I enjoy it? How do I get curious about it? Um, and and to make it though a consistent practice of bringing these things uh, into our lives, I think was another key part of it. Um, and then to really explore enjoyment. That seeing enjoyment as something I do, not something that just randomly falls out of the sky and lands on my breakfast plate. So, everybody, that's that was the uh, that was the journey with uh, emetophobia and cutting out the food avoidance. I think the other key exercise that was something that I really purposely practiced, um, in addition to these, was starting to actually eat on purpose right before any big uh, event or meeting or anything. And that's been so valuable. Um, even this past week, I was doing um, a, a corporate strategy workshop. And so it's so useful because actually they can be quite intense. We're doing meeting after meeting after meeting. Um, it's so useful now that I can uh, eat you know, in a 10 minute break and just shovel tons of food in uh, and then go right back to presenting. Because uh, other, yeah, in the past, I would have just not eaten all day. It was terrible. I'd say after, for much of my adult life, so until I was 30, I weighed basically the same amount, um, which is around like 175, 180. Uh, I weigh, uh, so after I started eating, whatever was useful to me to eat and I could exercise and I wasn't doing all these compulsions around food or compulsions around the gym. Uh, yeah, now I, I weigh 200, 210 pounds. Uh, cutting out compulsions around food. Yeah, absolutely. It was uh, transformative uh, and cutting out compulsions around exercise. So because, yeah, I, I could then actually pursue goals in fitness. Um, and that was uh impossible when I was, you know, spending entire days not eating. The uh, Wonderson, yes, did you end up liking eggs during that month? I would say I, yeah, like I, I would um, like make an omelet, order an omelet and not like not even think about it now. Um, totally. Yeah. It's totally, it's totally a normal part of my life now. Mm -hmm. Oh, poor potato. Thank you. Uh, so yeah, everybody, we can wrap things up there unless you have any questions. If you have any questions uh, you want to ask, uh, you know, personal challenges you're running into with cutting out food compulsions, anything like that, now is the time. Star just Taylor said, is mental fitness the key to make the brain less delusional? So I found it actually that I don't have to make the brain less delusional. I just have to see through its delusions. It actually it helps me much more to say the brain can throw up whatever it likes. I don't, it, I don't care the delusions the brain throws up. It's that I, the brain is just this random guy out on the street shouting stuff. So if he wants to shout delusional stuff, that's fine. He can go ahead because I don't put him in charge of my life anymore. Uh, it's my values that really show me what to do and where to go. And I would say that... That because if we wrestle with him, if we if you go out to that that random guy shouting on the street and you're like, I'm gonna I'm gonna teach you what's true, and you're not gonna shout delusions anymore, you're gonna be there a very long time wrestling with him. That's what happens with our brain. If we're like, brain, I'm gonna I'm gonna teach you to not be delusional. Uh, yeah, so it helped me just see that's just the, that's just the way the brain is. And but we can recognize that and see through that. Yeah, and so I'd say mental fitness. And, in, you know, that cognitive sort of psychological flexibility is really about starting to build that, you know, cognitive diffusion and separation with what the brain is throwing up uh, and seeing, yeah, no, the, there, what the brain throws up is stuff we experience. Um, and so, yeah, it can say whatever it wants to say and throw up whatever images it wants to throw up. 
And uh, yeah, because it's like it's a good brain. It tries hard, really, really hard. It tries hard. Nab that cat and run. He said you watched most of the interview today. Hope to discuss coping using food. Yeah, coping. Again, this is like so much of food is wrapped up in physical feelings and and things we feel. And so also just as much we might avoid food to avoid bad feelings. We might also try to use food uh, to control bad feelings. Um, but in the same the same way we work on the food avoidance compulsions, it's about learning how to interact differently with those uncomfortable feelings. I find it, it's the same with the the trying to use food to cover up uncomfortable feelings. Um, it's actually about saying, hey, no, like this this experience here, I can have this and I can explore it differently. And right, it's this again, this making friends with experiences that we'd hated for years. And we really believe, like to go back, yeah, you saw the interview today, what Corinne was talking about with uh, those equations and unhelpful beliefs we get stuck on. So where we get these equations where it's like, oh, well, if you have this feeling, you must go and fix it with food and starting to show the brain, no, if we have that feeling, yeah, we can have it. It's okay, of course, you know, this thing happened. Of course, I don't feel good about it right now. Uh, and I can have that feeling. I can, I can let that pain be there because uh, it's totally normal and natural. Um, and it can come along with me. Because the thing is, when we're always trying to cover up and control our experiences, it, it doesn't help them kind of rise and fall. They just kind of get stuck there. And then the next experience comes and gets stuck on top of it. And it's even worse. And then the next one and the next one. Uh, so learning how to embrace those feelings um, and take them along with us, I find, is, is, has helped me more than trying to, uh, yeah, cover them up. Uh, yeah. But it's, uh, it's a th yeah, it's totally, it's totally understandable. And so it's even seeing, you know, next time there's a situation where you know you might typically uh, get into some, like, food coping behaviors. Uh, it really helps to, in advance, identify what's a, uh, an action you can do instead that you would want to do in that situation. And then you, you set that up so it's easy to do when that time arrives. And then, uh, yeah, you practice bringing your brain along with you, recognizing why it feels bad, giving it that hug, saying, brain, yeah, I know this doesn't feel good. Uh, but yeah, come along with me. I have something we can do that's better for us. Um, and it's okay if we feel bad right now while well, we do that. Yeah. Everybody, uh, yeah, that brings us to the end of the chat. Yeah, why don't we wrap things up there? And of course, we can always continue this conversation. I'm probably going to put this video up on YouTube. We can always continue the conversation there or, uh, yeah, on Instagram, on the Discord server. Uh, food's a big thing, so I don't think uh, we necessarily cover all of it in uh, a single stream but i think it's so it's so useful to look at often we'll see our the mental health challenges we're running into as you know falling into some bucket or theme uh but i feel like so many of us struggle with food challenges yeah nap that can run thanks for the cheer and the support thank you everybody it's awesome that we can get together and talk about nourishing ourselves uh, so yeah, I hope everybody, whether it's morning or night, um, I hope your day ahead or your tomorrow uh, is full of a yeah, healthier relationship with food and uncomfortable feelings.